Okay, um, we are ready to start. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for Neurolectics webinar. Uh, my name is Rafael Novak, and I will be again your host today. Today, we'll be talking about transcranial direct current stimulation in the pediatric brain. Uh, we are, talk are going to talk about challenges and open questions. I'm very happy to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Vera Moliaze. Hi, Vera. Hi, Roman. Hi, people. Uh, good to have you here, Vera. So we'll begin with Vera's presentation, and this will be followed by Q&A period. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A tool. And uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be also available offline. So please uh, let me quickly introduce our speaker, Dr. Vera Moliaze. Uh, Vera obtained her biology degree from the Tbilisi State University in Georgia. She received a PhD from the Ruhr University in Bochum in Germany under the supervision of Professor Klaus Funke. After her PhD, Vera joined the group of Professor Walter Paulus and Professor Andrea Antal in Göttingen in Germany. After Göttingen, actually, she, she started working in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the Frankfurt University. In Frankfurt, she started to work in area of non-invasive brain stimulation in pediatrics. And now Vera is at the Institute of Medical Psychology and Medical Sociology at uh, Kiel University in Germany, where she leads the Neurophysiological Lab and Transcranial Brain Stimulation Group. So again, obviously, a lot of shared interest with us here at Neuroelectrics, and especially that uh, we are working together with Vera in the European Union Horizon 2020 stipend project, stimulation in pediatrics. So, okay, welcome, Vera, uh, all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael, for inviting me. And generally, thank you for organizing this webinar. And really, I join and follow these talks. And that's for me, it's great pleasure to be a speaker today. And thank you for this opportunity. And it's our pleasure. I, uh, I will share my screen. I hope you can see everything. So can you see it in presentation models? Yes, it's perfect. Cool. So my topic and my, my question, open question, as Rafael mentioned, is about transcranial direct current stimulation in the pediatric brain. What is questions and challenges? And I'm a, I'm a, my talk, uh, based almost based on the control healthy uh, children to find out which parameters we need to use maybe later for as a therapeutic um, reason. And uh, there are this many challenges and open questions. And I think in this of talk, I will, you have feelings that this is many open questions. And actually it is also my motivation and our motivation in this group in the SIPED project also to ask good questions, critical questions to find a way to improve this I think very really important and challenging topic uh, in the area of brain stimulation, brain stimulation in pediatrics. So interest in this area is really increased, but I have to say this idea to stimulate pediatric brain, it's uh, not new. And somehow this is a destiny of TDCS, as a TDCS is very old technique and somehow it is new techniques. I've got to try to find a way to use this TDCS from different way, from different disease and so on. What we know from pediatric population, um, in 1904, it's published two studies. First is Russia, and it was translated later. And study was about to use method of transcranial micropolarization in children with cerebral palsy. Sounds, what is this transcranial micropolarization? But if you read this method very um, carefully, you will find out that it is typical standard transcranial direct current kind of stimulation. What they did, they stimulate 40 patients aged 8 until 15 year olds with very small electrodes. And it was also reason why they use very uh, low current density, about 0.3 milliampere. This uh, analog stimulation um, was the frontal cortex, this is target area, and cathode was above mastoid. And then session was 20, 40 minutes. And an idea, this was just very successful stimulation. They found some improvement. And it was idea to use this micropolarization, TDCA stimulation as a possible therapeutic, uh, therapeutic reason to, uh, um, to, to treat uh, the cerebral palsy. And later it was somehow quiet. It was no studies about this in pediatric um, in stimulation. And now if you see this in PubMed, this number of studies really increased. And then we have different 
disease in development of disorders to use TDCS with different montages, stimulation, duration, intensities, and so on. I here just put some, some studies almost in ADHD and, and autism and showing this it's there has this potential TDCS. And you have to also know that there's different studies using different montages, different intensities, different durations. There are promising uh, uh, results, but also are the studies showing negative or new findings. It's, for example, this is a last study from group from Katia Rubia they shown it's not so effective for this um, ADHD group. They stimulate 50 uh, ADHD children and they found actually no um, effect of the TDCS. But this year, this original uh, studies, they are also very nice reviews, increased also last year, very huge number of studies about review generally in different disease, review about ADHD, autism, and so on. Very recently, um, a current Kadosh, Tino Tsela, or the Kau, uh, Kers Kersen Kau, uh, organized this topic, non-invasive brain stimulation in neurodevelopmental disorders in progress in brain research, as with very nice studies, also review studies, and you can find these very recent reviews about ADHD and autism in this uh, book series. Okay, it is interesting. It's increased number of the studies in our pediatric stimulation, but there are so still many questions showing very promising results, not only in ADHD, autism, also dyslexia, uh, epilepsy, but still is lacking methodological questions and methodological factors, what we know and how do, do we know which parameter we, are, we have to use in pediatric population. They are really missing this is translational study from others to, uh, to children. Because just take home message from this side is all the studies, what we uh, showed, the, the publications and studies based on uh, findings from adult studies. And I think, and I agree, I think with this, it's not really correct. We, we, we are not just transfer all these parameters from adults to children. Um, because there are so many known unknowns uh, in this area of pediatric stimulation. And this is very nice review from uh, Nick Davis uh, summarizes known unknowns and this is really methodological factor. This is because we don't know exactly effect of the stimulation in pediatric brain. What about side effect of the stimulation? What about with dosage, how we, uh, which intensity I have to use, how long I have to stimulate, how often? And then hey, a message and big problem is again, the lack of translational studies from adults in, to children. And why it should be a problem for this? Um, because we are all, all I think, for non-invasive brain stimulation community from TDCS community. And then we know, of course, there are so many factors influencing TDCS, right? Is this a methodological factor or physiological factor? It will be physiological brain state, uh, um, it will be functional brain state, genetic, um, hormonal level and age. And today this is our topic, age of participants. And then about age, when we are talking especially about developmental brain, of course, TDCS affects uh, of the age and then developmental brain. And same time, age and developmental state of the brain as is uh, influencing TDCS outcomes, right? This is a uh, both side uh, influence. And then why? Why TDCS and um, age can uh, influence the outcome of TDCS? What is the reason? possible reason for this. Again, here, many studies showing that, for example, it should be, could be um, anatomical features because the uh, early studies on Kessler showing that this uh, pill distribution when small brain, let's say, is different when you compare to this, this adult brain. Another thing could be uh, functional connectivity in children and adults is different. And I uh, mentioned before, functional state of the brain uh, affect of the outcome of TDCS. Different uh, structural connectivity. Also, this is uh, some anatomical factors. And then especially when we are talking about the developmental brain and developmental stage, hormonal changes, because when we have the children and adolescents in the age of teens, of course, they have this modulation of the hormonal state and it had also influence of the TDCS outcomes. And again, TDCS can affect of this brain differently. And then most important, and we are talking about excitability, when we are talking about um, plasticity, of course, is a, a neurotransmitter level. And then, as you know, this is for the stimulation techniques, non-invasive brain stimulation, and especially for TDCS, excitatory inhibitory balance in the brain. This uh, the balance between different neurotransmitters this is very crucial. 
And then when we are talking about GABA and NMDA and excitatory inhibitory balance, of course, it is a classical how TDCS works because I think it's everybody knows this mechanism very generally. It is very simple in explanation for this. And then we will think that uh, analog stimulation, at least for motor cortex, one milliampere stimulation is excitatory. This means we have LTP. And then in one milliampere cardio stimulation, again, at least for motor cortex, this is a LTD decrease and an inhibitory effect. And this means plasticity change, it changed excitatory inhibitory balance. And this study showing also this uh, Michel Paulus, which is part of this era of TBC, showing that in, indeed anodal cardiac stimulation. I know this very simple explanation anodal is uh, excitatory and cardiac is inhibitory. Now we know this is additional factors that is also very crucial, but just think very simply way on, on this. Uh, um, okay, this is a plasticity, TDCS, and this means if children is just more and more plastic, let's say that they have different excitatory inhibitory balance, it could be they will very uh, different effect of TDCS we, shall, we can have in this uh, child brain. And this question, what it does mean to use parameters, to transfer parameters from other study to uh, children, we asked about six years ago, it was in 2015, it was in Frankfurt, when we started uh, to work in the uh, area of transcranial brain stimulation with Michael Sinachkin together in um, Carolina Rosen's Psychiatry in Frankfurt, and we asked a very simple question. Let's do like this. Uh, those same uh, study designs that Michael and Paulus in 2000 stimulate motor cortex, same montage, same duration, and let's see what happened. Our uh, motivation and then a hypothesis more or less was that maybe in case of children, we will have more excitability and more uh, big in motor evoked potential. Again, this was what we did. Here, as you see, we have TMS evoked potential. And additionally, we also recorded uh, EG because we wanted to also analyze TM, um, TMS evoked uh, EG potentials. Classical montage or classical study designs, we recorded uh, before stimulation, motor evoked potential, peak to peak amplitude, one milliampere, in one millivolt, sorry. And then we stimulate motor cortex, one milliampere for 10 minutes, and then check what happened um, for next one hour, okay? So, and now is our results. What you can see here, uh, uh, this is a motor evoked potential amplitude, peak to peak amplitude. We have shunt stimulation, we have cathodal stimulation, we have analog stimulation, and shunt stimulation has no effect. It's great, so we get a good, good control. But interestingly, what we found one milliampere anodal stimulation and one milliampere cathodal stimulation show the same direction, both were excitatory. And then here, just you can see recalculation of this that um, the motor work potential amplitudes here. So first 10 minutes, it was actually was no effect, which you can see also here. And then there is later comes effect, excitatory effect from both anodal stimulation and cathodal stimulation. And just remember what we know from other studies, same montage, same duration, same intensity. This is a classical feature, anodal increase, cathodal decrease. These results um, were somehow um, surprised, paradoxical, but I would say it's not really paradoxical because we study we, the study we performed in 2015. And then in this time, we already knew that this is a not only polarity is crucial because uh, previously in other studies, uh, the, we also showed this time in Gottingen that we are there non linear stimulation effects. And what here in Cecilia Georgi Batskaz did was that is an intensity dependent effect of TDCS. And he found also if you are increase uh, uh, intensity of cathodal stimulation, and we have two milliampere cathodal stimulation, two milliampere cathodal stimulation is also excitatory, what you can see here. And you can see just as a comparison between one milliampere cathodal stimulation classical inhibition and two milliampere cathodal stimulation excitatory effect. And then we think, okay, it could be for children, one milliampere cathodal stimulation is too much. And it is the reason why we, we uh, we go to the um, uh, direction of excitation. And what we did, we decided to recruit same children and then uh, just stimulation with half intensity, just very simple idea and very simple design. So in first experiment one, we had these 19 children. In experiment two, same children, but only 10 because not everybody wanted to come for some reasons. And then we did uh, 0.5 analog stimulation, 0.5 cardiac stimulation. 
And indeed, we found that for cathodal stimulation, what you can see here, or 0.5 milliampere stimulation, uh, like, like 1 milliampere um, in adults, is also inhibitory. And what you can see this effect here. For uh, adult stimulation, actually, this was not intensity dependent. And then if you have less so-called excitatory protocol, excitatory stimulation, in this case, we need a little bit more to reach this uh, excitatory effect. So here we have intensity dependent effect. Um, okay, uh, as I mentioned, we have all, also a measured TMS evoked uh, potential, and then there are several time locked EEG response, uh, and have we found to in association with single pass uh, TMS and M1. And you can see different potentials. And we decided to measure N100 because N100 is suggested to reflect inhibitory processes. And then we wanted to find out maybe if you have this modulation N100, it could be explanation or additional information why we found an uh, um, excitatory effect for one milliampere a cathedral stimulation of for the MEP amplitudes. Additionally, N100 is a very important parameter, TMS evoked N100, because studies from Stefan Bender shown that this, uh, this N100 goes under maturational changes and is uh, using as a parameter for ADHD subject to children and generally for children as a marker, let's say for this uh, uh, inhibitory processes. Okay, what we did and what we found. Here we can see our, uh, can see our results for TMS evoked potential uh, N100 and then here is this uh, <clears throat> Blue is the CFO cathodal stimulation, green is the uh, sham stimulation, and uh, red is annular stimulation. Here you can see the topography differences, means first is always sham minus annular stimulation, and then second that is uh, sham minus cathodal stimulation. And this is different types. And what we found here, found that this is a modulation N100 after cathodal stimulation. And interestingly, these changes we found in first 10 minutes, remember? For MAP uh, effects, we found it's later. It looks like that EEG response is we have directly, more directly, so just first 10 to 20 minutes and later not, but later we have um, motor evoked potential effect. And here we found uh, after one million per cathedral stimulation, we have decreased N100 amplitude, meaning we have decrease of inhibition. And it is also explanation for our excitatory effect of uh, cathodal stimulation at the intensity one milliampere. Okay, and then this is here, just messages here that one milliampere cathodal stimulation is different at the, when we measure motor evoked potential and TMS evoked potential. But, uh, but also interesting, the later study from Adam Carton and Kirton also shown that in children for this motor learning, show same effect, one milliampere anodal and one milliampere cathodal have same effect, both are excitatory. And question is, is what could be the reason for this? Uh, how can we explain it? This may be some uh, anatomical factors that influence all these intensity dependent effects which related only with ages. And then what we did together um, with uh, Alexander Hunold and uh, uh, Jens Haueisen, we uh, measured this, we had this MRI from these children, not all of these children from our studies, but some. And then we measure current density and uh, skill thickness. And it is really related to this. This means less skill thickness when we have high current density. It means this is anatomical factors influence of this uh, um, outcomes of TDCS. Yeah, and here, um, but you just, just, just to show how it is dependence, intensity dependent. But we have to be always, um, careful and more uh, critical to ourselves, maybe not only age is a uh, factor which influence all these uh, outcomes, right? Because we are measure here only one parameters, anatomical factors, but we are talking about more complex organ. We are talking about brain, but some different factors could also influence. But at least for our age groups, we show this intensity and effects. So this question about individual variation and factors which influence the TDCS outcomes and again how TDCS can influence on this development of brain. As Rafael mentioned, we started this um, uh, European project as a stipend stimulation in pediatrics. And then I would like to present this study as uh, this project and then show our results. This study is coordinated by Michael Sinerchkin from 
elephant battle. And then here you can see how, what is our idea? What is our motivation? What we want to investigate? We have, as usual, from the multi multicenter studies, different work packages. And then we are here, work package three. And then we are investigating only healthy children. Idea, general idea of STIPED is to uh, develop a treatment for ADHD and autism, and also understand mechanism in combination with stimulation. And please note that we as a healthy, healthy control group, we are not really controlled for, for um, the patient. I know we don't, we don't have direct comparison. Our motivation to have this control group just to try to develop optimal parameters for the pediatric brain. Um, and in this work package three, in this health group, we have uh, three independent brain stimulation. Um, we have a uh, group where we stimulate dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We have group uh, stimulating right EFG, and we have stimulation TPJ. Why is this structure? Yes, I mentioned that is we are not directly comparison with control group for patient, but generally, of course, we wanted to have this. this uh, uh, this is a homogen project and then to have the sa same area of stimulation as an ADHD and, and autism. And then for our uh, ADHD group, also it is very important in target region. This is almost as a uh, 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 dorsal atrial prefrontal cortex and EFG. And then for uh, autism is TPJ. And for TPJ group, this is responsible, this is the Coimbra and they are doing the stimulation. And then here in the prefrontal cortex stimulation and EFG, we are doing in kill and on B level. Maybe now you will ask, why is this, this stimulation? You know, we are using here multi-channel stimulation with different uh, electrodes. We have two milliampere total inject current of stimulation. And then, but for each electrode, we have less than one milliampere. Why is this multi-channel stimulation? We wanted to have more focal stimulation, you know? We, are, we have this optimi, op, optimizing group, optimizing stimulation, and we wanted to stimulate not more, more focal. In previous study in adults, uh, showed this multifocal stimulation could be better, at least it was shown, uh, studied by Fisher et al. in 2017, published in neuroimaging. They showed if we have compared this classical bilateral montage with multifocal stimulation, network stimulation, network stimulation should be better. But what it does mean for dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you know, motor cortex is a little bit simple compared to the prefrontal cortex, and how it is in case of prefrontal cortex. Can we use this multi channel stimulation? directly to children. And we decided before we do this in children, just to test what it does mean, multi-channel uh, stimulation in adult brain. And we performed this study brought by Michael Spitzerta, and then we tested this uh, multifocal stimulation, multi-channel stimulation for adult brains, with direct comparison with bipolar montage. And then here we have uh, target was task was the end back task, and then we have this uh, two back uh, with the accuracy. And what we found, we actually did not found any priority in advantage the bipolar with multi-channel stimulation. But if you take account baseline performance of the subject, then multi-channel stimulation seems to be better. Meaning if somebody is from beginning with baseline shows low performance, they have better effect after multi-channel stimulation. And as this means again, just to take it into account just one factor and to find out outcomes of TDCS, not enough. You have to always try to control our studies and then see more and more global way to reach our very good and local effect. Okay, for multi-channel stimulation seems to be for adults, their dorsal atrial prefrontal cortex good. Let's see what happens if you are using this kind of stimulation in children. And um, here <clears throat> today, I will uh, only present uh, the prefrontal cortex stimulation. EFG and TPJ will come later. But what we have for dorsolateral prefrontal cortex stimulation? How was our design? Children uh, for this have to come six times. First appointment is as a baseline, meaning we have screening. We have 64 EEG just to have baseline EEG and just different screening questionnaires and so on. And then for stimulation, they are coming uh, four times because we have two times sham stimulation, two times verum stimulation. Why two times sham and verum? Because we wanted to also additionally to investigate when we have to stimulate timing of the stimulation during the task, meaning task and target task, in this case, two back task, or first the stimulation, then a task. 
an online offline stimulation, let's say like this. We have also resting state EEG, and we also have non-target tasks because I, we wanted to really control our study. Maybe if you are seeing something in target task or other way around to, to find out that this is my effect of the stimulation, what we see is a specific for this region, for specific for this task, we need to have additional control to say, yes, this is effect specific for this task. Um, and then it was four times for stimulation. And finally, last measurement was MRI. For each child, we have MRI, just a development individual stimulation later. But I will talk about this a little bit later. What we found for this multi-channel stimulation for this uh, prefrontal cortex. Interesting finding. Actually, we did not find any effect on target task. Here, what you can see here. But so-called non-target task, this no flanker task, we found effect and then reaction time. They, this means what you can see here, after this um, multifocal, multi-channel stimulation from their solar prefrontal cortex, we found the children are just more fast. Now reaction time is decreased and which um, correlate is increased uh, beta frequency, what you can see here. Meaning, we can say that we found our effect in non-target tasks, but same time we have to be careful. Our flanker task was not really specific for the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but have some component of this working memory and so on. And it could be some transfer effects to see here. And then uh, we did not find any relationship between electrical filter, filter and distribution and then the effect of TDCS. As I mentioned, we have uh, MRI from each child and then based on this individual MRI, we checked the how is this distribution electrical field. And um, uh, our result is somehow this is, uh, could be, depends on the review, you know, somehow this is a negative result, somehow is uh, no findings, but for me, I think it shows importance to control studies very well, to have uh, control tasks to, to measure the, the, also here, this is electric field distribution, it's great to have this one. And then we need always to control our studies because without to have this control task in this case, we cannot say no effect. And then some effects could be undetected, right? And then when we don't see uh, some effect for TDCS, to generate non brain stimulation, it does not mean that TDC does not work. It could be that we are, our tasks, our paradigm not sensitive enough to find this effect. So what we plan as a next, as a next we uh, uh, plan to apply more individualized stimulation. As I mentioned before, not age is, is a crucial, but important. It could be more individual factors we have to take into account. For this reason, um, we will rec uh, recruit same children again, which participated in first study, and then each child will receive, based on anatomy, development uh, montage. So means each child uh, will have special and individualized stimulation, and we will see what happened. How will this does work? Of course, this is a to development individualized stimulation. It takes time, but based on our first study. We already development pipeline how it does work. And if you are interested in details, how would we analyze exactly and then with methodological factors? Ricardo Salvador, it is a, uh, we published this study from these children, from this individual montage. And now we know how it does work. Meaning, we will first measure MRI, then based this MRI, we will send it to our server and then new electrics and then uh, Denmark, uh, Axel Tilshar Group will tell us which montage we have to use for this child, for this subject, and then we will stimulate with individualized stimulation. But again, we will have again this optimized stimulation, what we use in study one, just to have this direct comparison. Okay, this is a um, multi uh, network stimulation. And I would like to uh, show also another study we are using this as network stimulation. It's not stipend, but again, based on this multi-channel stimulation, network stimulation. And it is our so-called pizza study. We are studying to uh, try to investigate numerical cognition. And what does mean um, proportion, understand as a fraction understanding. It is not uh, only important to know how much pizza left, but just to, this, this important issue for this uh, mathematical learning. And then we have cooperation with uh, Tübingen and uh, Zilke Water, but now Zilke is, is a postdoc in uh, Greifswald. And then we are wanted to stimulate children and adults also with uh, 
and then they are doing some mathematical task. And then here we have stimulation for dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and then we have stimulation from EPS because both structure MRI studies show that it is important for this numerical cognition, um, uh, numerical cognition. And then uh, here, what we are doing, we are using again multi-channel stimulation, and then we have the resting state EEG. We have here <clears throat> stimulate for 20, uh, 20 minutes, two milliampere stimulation. Please note, we are talking about total injected current, and this for each uh, electron, it is less than one electrode. And we have uh, also, um, since we are stimulated also the lateral prefrontal cortex is a control task. We have again end back task to show at least if you are, don't see any effect here this, uh, for mathematical paradigms, at least maybe to show that we reach the lateral prefrontal cortex, we have also this task. Um, I'll, you can see here very preliminary results at the behavioral level. And then uh, what you can, you can found out for example, we are st for EPS stimulation for children, it's better. This means the absence the reaction time, response time, they are less because you are doing this uh, uh, paradigm, this um, task more, more fast. But in uh, adults, it's different. This means, again, this study shows differences between adults and children when we stimulate same montage, same intensity. But uh, as the next we are planning, we have this uh, EEG during the uh, stimulation, also before, after, and then with this analysis, we hope that we will have more additional information to explain these results. I think very shortly, I, will, uh, I can could show you some main message that children cannot be considered as a small adults when testing medical intervention. Generally, for everything, but we are talking here about medical intervention, and we have to be always careful and then just transfer this para parameter from adults. Especially, this is a very crucial and very important when you are talking about safety and tolerability. In the next slide, I will show what does mean, how safe is this stimulation in children. Here again, this is many studies all the quite a uh, uh, long time before, so I mean, it's okay, 10, 10, five years ago, already done and showing that there are studies and then showing um, Stimulation is tolerated well. Even some studies from uh, Alexander Pratt and Christensen, they stimulate during the sleep, and it, it's quite, um, quite a, um, current density, it was quite quite high current density, as they shown, but also well tolerated. What we know about this multi-channel stimulation about from our stipend, stipend study, and then I would like to show you our results from this tolerability and safety side. And we are using in our studies this side effect questionnaires and it's adapted and based on guidelines from Andir and from 2017. And then here's this questionnaire when we are asking same question, each in um, uh, does it uh, tiredness or um, headache or so on, this is standard questionnaire, but adapted for children. But what we have also additionally is, is we are calling six months after last visit and we are asking question about um, how is this now, how was sleep, how if something happened, a headache, migraine, and so on. Um, two other results here about this uh, tolerability. Here we have uh, prefrontal cortex stimulation, 28 subject. We have uh, here EFG stimulation. And you can see here we have, like in others, we have itching, burning, um, metal fatigue on some same parameters actually what in adults. In some SSC are also significant different, but some somehow it is here for <clears throat> sham stimulation, it was more. Seems like that this is tolerated quite well and we have less side effect. Um, but question is uh, side effects immediately after stimulation, but we have also questionnaire between stimulation and they came again one week uh, after or two weeks after we are uh, asking what happened between if you have some sleep problems and so on and you can see here as our result this uh, looks quite okay how many tdc sessions we had uh, different kind of stimulation we have this stimulation and task same time or offline stimulation and then one interesting point this is here here migraine one child is supported uh, reported uh, migraine and this is here, here after six months after the last visit. And of course, it could be related to, to uh, stimulation, but same times we have to also think about this as their children, is their developmental stage, is this a girl, some hormonal changes. We cannot say exactly causality. This is a to do with TDCS, but I think it's very important to report all these side effects, all 
or questionnaires or analyzing data has because we need more information about it, right? And if study, if sometimes collect this data in few years, then we know more. And based on this questionnaire so far, we can say that we are in accordance in period studies this is about safety or tolerability of transcranial direct current stimulation and generally non noisy brain stimulation. Here is a study from uh, Adam Kirton that from 3.5 million stimulation sessions and then shown that 612 TDC sessions, including for, uh, 92 uh, children, well correlated to the stimulation. But here again, Question, based on this questionnaire, based on this uh, itching, tingling, can we say this is just safe? Can we say about, can we talk about safety? In my opinion, not really, because, okay, we can say tolerability, yes, but not safety, because it's that's really different between safety and tolerability. And then so far, based on the study, what we have now, we can say that in terms of tolerability, there are no concerns to use TDC pediatrics in children's brain, but about safety, in my opinion, this little bit too early to say if it's really safe or not, because we don't have still enough data for long-lasting effect of TDCs. Again, brain is in development last stage and we don't know. Another important issue, what we have to talk, and then when we start a stimulation like this, uh, we always say, what about ethic? And then especially when you try to stimulate healthy children. Do we need to stimulate healthy children? So far, I always present, uh, presented all the healthy children studies and um, results. And I think, yes, because again, this effect of stimulation and outcomes and so on, it's very complex. We always need to minimize some vari uh, variability, right? And then at least we have to know this is baseline activity, this um, oscillation in brain, this is somehow it is not pathological to exclude this additional variability also. And then we need this healthy brain, neurotypical developmental brain to optimize parameter of stimulation. And then if we need always this stimulation, healthy children, it is also somehow we have to say stop. Not we don't need for each study with healthy children. But this is I know this sentence is quite quite confusing. How do uh, can we know what is enough? But at least if for some age group for uh, uh, stimulation targets, we already development optimized stimulation. If we know how is this uh, electric dis uh, field distribution, then maybe for a later study for patient study we. we you are always not necessary to have also healthy brain as a control. Um, because it is a problem also to just to include healthy children, right? They are coming here, we are doing some studies and something could be happening. And then it is indeed in our study, we have this is case report. And then from um, 70 year old girl, so healthy participated in the study. And then five days after uh, stimulation, and then later we found out this was really st very stimulation. Here, this is epileptic seizure. And then she went to the clinic and diagnostic uh, epileptic seizure. We, we analyzed all this data. As I mentioned, we have EEG also during the stimulation and everything is fine. It was no some epileptic seizure during the stimulation and so on. But later in this clinic during the diagnosis, uh, was find, uh, found out that it was, a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And what we can do here better, I think it's more important in our message this time when we start, uh, report, uh, submit and then publish this case report, our motivation was just we have to be careful during the screening, right? We have to ask, sometimes that's not just, we are, uh, do we have epilepsy, yes or not? And then we have to more ask in details and then to say it's good possible reason somehow this epilepsy could be there because again, their children is not yet diagnosed this uh, disease, right? And then of course, this is a, a seizure. It was not from this uh, physiological point of view. It's important and it's crucial to, to, to submit in the report, but also ethical reason. And then we, uh, we have this published from the ethical point of view and uh, um, uh, interview from the child and um, uh, parents as a mother. And then here is just wanted to message people. We have to be careful. We are talking about development our brain. And then we are talking about this ethic, of course, uh, in this uh, work package, in the SIPED project, we have this uh, ethical work package, which is very important. And then for each uh, group, it will be healthy in our case, or ADHD, or um, uh, autism, always is uh, 
performance this ethical interview and we are collecting data also from this side. Yeah, to summarize this one, uh, is actually more of this as an ethical point of view and the safety and the tolerability. Um, we have just, we can say this is a very well tolerated, but still we need more data. We need to, to report all each details, more detailed questionnaires. And we always have to try if it's possible, of course, to do this multimodal studies, to have MRI, to have EEG, just to find out what happened in this brain and then how we can optimize this stimulation parameter. And I think in next years, next times, we will have more data and then we can say we are more safe. And of course, this is most important question is always this is home-based stimulation. And in the CIPED project, of we have also this uh, CIPED project, we have also this part. And then at the moment we are collecting data and then but at the moment, I think it's a little bit early to talk about safety in this area, but it's my opinion. We are working on this and then we'll see. And then if next time, if somebody will ask you if you are willing to that your child brain, brain, then you say, yes, this means what we did before it was good enough. And then uh, parents are also feeling this is safe. And then we can use this quite promising stimulation in this area in a special group and, and Yes, it was from my side. And of course, I would like to thank these great people. My institute is the Kiel University. Here it's my group and the Frau Kenis for supporting our all the stimulation study. And the medical doctoral students, of course, they are doing this all this study. Special thanks to Maike. She did great work. And of course, uh, Stipert project, Michal Senyachkin as a coordinator and my collaborators. Thank you very much. It was from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vera, for a great presentation. Uh, we are ready to take uh, some questions. Um, so let me let me only just waiting. We are waiting yeah. for, the, for the question to, to pop up. Let me let me ask regarding the safety. You have mentioned many times actually the safety of uh, of the stimulation. Yeah. So I actually I would compare this to the to the COVID vaccine. We we are talking about tolerability, about uh, safety based yeah. on the period that we can evaluate. So it's yeah. the same for the stimulation. It's not that it's not safety. It's that we don't the, we didn't pass the enough time yeah. to. To, to, to talk about uh, about uh, adverse effects or side, side yeah. effects, but there are not specific side effects or adverse effects mm, comparing, for example, to adults. Yeah, I mean, what I'm talking about safety, right? This is when we're talking about long lasting effects. Yeah. Because if you are, this is a brain, this is developmental stage. If you are thinking that this is in uh, developmental brain, in child, child brain, we have more plasticity. We don't know how long it will be this effect and how it is modulated later. And then tolerability, again, the side effects similar to others, but I'm talking about this uh, plasticity in the brain, how it's affect this stimulation for, for a long time period. We don't know, in my opinion, it's too, too early. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And, and, and actually, that's yeah. why we want to use in, 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 in pediatric brain. Yeah, in, in exactly. regards yeah. To, to plasticity, uh, expecting yeah. that the, the effect should be a quicker, better, and uh, if, if applied correctly, with regards to yeah. neuroplasticity. And uh, with regards to, to actually to use of half of the current you were mentioning, there yeah. is actually, there, there is a lot of papers that, uh, yeah. that we should actually use in, 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 key, in kids and in children, uh, half of the current uh, comparing to adults. There are another studies that are using actually the same parameters than in, in, in adults, uh, so up to two milliampers. Uh, yeah. What, what, what's your opinion about this? I mean, this is, yeah, why is this yeah, for cut? It's actually, it's interesting, but for exit, we call it excitatory stimulation, another stimulation, it's, we don't have this, this yeah, more is less and less is more. You mean this is direction. It was also different kind of stimulation. It looks like that is yeah, more so-called inhibitory protocols. It was for, uh, it's more sensitive. And then I don't know, maybe it is some neurotransmitter uh, reason for this, but it seems like this, for example, in a cathodal stimulation, later studies from Nietzsche's group show, if you go up, this, uh, this goes again, this no length, and then we have again an inhibitory effect. And again, seems to be based on the special neurotransmitter reasons and parameters also, all this depends on this, uh, for cathodal stimulation seems to be more more sensitive. 
And then, for example, we pre before we shown this for uh, um, alternating current stimulation with different intensities. First, if you have this in inhibitory protocols, inhibitory stimulation beginning, they show also excitatory and then switch to this uh, excitatory effects because we have also this, this balance between. Yeah, I don't know if I answered this question, but um, yes, yes. <laughs> This is hard sure. To say. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, 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 so. Thank you very much, actually, for for the presentation and explaining this and how important our studies based on the uh, normal subjects. Because I, I guess that our audience is expecting uh, like recipes uh, to for the treatment of of specific disorders and especially in terms of pediatric yeah. uh, stimulation. But the first step is actually to have to. Uh, proof uh, how the stimulation work in the normal subjects, yeah. how it was the effect of the task. And, uh, and uh, in, in, a, in a clinical applications, we can find already application in, in, in epilepsy, in reactory epilepsy, yeah, yeah. in cerebral palsy, in ADHD, in TDA, TDA uh, uh, ADHD. Yeah. Uh, but there are not so many, for example, in, in, uh, in the schizophrenia or in, in directly in psychiatry. There are other yeah. any reason for not application of TDCS co in comparison to adults, where we can find a lot of studies with yeah. in psychiatry. And in, in the pediatric uh, population, it's, uh, it's quite less. Yeah. I mean, actually, it is interesting is this yeah, TDCS in patients with schizophrenic children. It actually, one of the first study when they're using in psychiatric disorders, it was, I think, 2011 from Schneider, they used in children with schizophrenia. And they were also using soft two, 2 milliampere, but it's not intensively studied as an ADHD and other disease. But generally, when you're talking again about this healthy children, control group with patients, of course, patients itself, it's different brain. Of course, if you are using parameters from healthy children, we cannot say this is optimal for patients because we have different oscillation. But in my opinion, if you are, uh, we have to transfer this directly to patient, at least we have to transfer this parameter at least from same age group, not from adults. And it is uh, um, my opinion because for this, we need this is a control groups. But again, of course, it is very hard always to have this healthy children for stimulation. Let's you know. This is, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to the question from from audience. First question from Islam regarding uh, regarding the application of TDCS in pediatric patients. If there is any approved application in normal clinical settings, uh, or it is used still only in research settings or studies. As I know, there are some, some clinical studies that some clinical trials are starting in using TDCS as a stimulation. This is ADHD. This is, uh, you can find these clinical trials. This is also autism, um, epilepsy, cerebral palsy. Okay, it's not direct. This is, um, uh, yeah. They are using this stimulation. Yes, is it? Yeah. Okay, so okay. actually we are waiting for the for yeah. the results to have uh, yeah. to have some of course we need more this control studied but they are running studies as clinical trials using the stimulation as a as a therapy yeah okay next question from nelly uh, thank you for the great lecture most studies are including children at early adolescence seven to ten years old uh, what about tdcs in infants uh, with less than three years Oh, yes, it's a, uh, this is a very interesting question. And then indeed, even it was a question, uh, TMS, this is for using it babies. Actually, there are studies in their group, and this is in Boston, Rottenberger, they are using very, very stimulation in babies, not yet in, 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 in TDCS, but uh, yeah, this planning, as I know, for TMS, yes. There are some studies go this direction, and then we not yet. But it's of course it's very uh, important issue, especially depends on which disease. Of course, if you are you are talking about epilepsy and then stimulation, we need to, to to treat as early as possible, right? And then they are going this direction also. This is it's quite interesting. Yeah. So so you, so you assume that actually we will will have another constraint for these groups different from 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 adolescents because you were talking about school thickness effect uh, or then 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 uh, conductivity yeah so for the very very small kids there will be another group with specific parameters where actually the personalized stimulation based on yes, individual yes. mri would uh, would play the main the main role yeah but actually, this is one thing is this anatomical this, uh, thing, of course, this thickness and so on. But there are also these different uh, things. For example, interestingly, these children with TMS, they need high, high intensity. 
because they, they have high threshold of TMS and this decrease of this parameter with this age. Again, we are talking not what just uh, this thickness and so on. The anatomical is just one factor. There are also additional factors, this cortical excitability, which is different, right? And then in TMS case, when you measure this TMS and local potential in children, they need high intensity to reach this one uh, will you pick to pick amplitude. It is different uh, challenge. <laughs> Okay. Yes. 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 So, so actually, for the models, and actually, yeah. what we started to use uh, here, neuroelectrics, is to use not only physical model, physics yeah. uh, based on the anatomy, but also neurophysiology as a, as a very important it part. Be, it will be great, but because based only one parameter is not enough. Yeah. I mean, we always, for this reason, when we are discussing and interpreting our data, we have to say based on which parameter we found out, based on what we, we know, like this. But as I mentioned, more more parameters is complexity and combination is different parameters it will be great yeah okay next question from Gennady. are you using any of normal eg database like hbi human brain index uh, i guess this is in context of the of the stimulation based on on eg or comparing eg in in, uh, in uh, subjects with the with the normalized eg database no actually what is eg not not yet. We are using this EEG. What I uh, showing it was from our uh, subject. N not yet. But so okay. just to to find a way. Yeah. No, not yet. Okay. And the question from Randy. Actually, what we were talking a few seconds ago. Since a lot of brain architecture is developed in the first three years, will you test using TDA, TDCS during this main development phases? Like first, first free yeah, year. Maybe, but just as uh, maybe, uh, at the moment we are we are working at it from ten, but we try to decrease this age. Yes, but yeah, especially then, depend on the disease. You know, just with specific for disease, it's important to stimulate in early stage, especially for epilepsy. It will be. Yeah, and we have great. to we have to remember that then we have to deal with ethical committee, especially if you are going to so so. Yes, <laughs> this is another Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> challenge. Uh, question from Benedict, thanks uh, for the nice talk. Is there already something known about neurotransmitter like GABA, glutamate, concentration after the stimulation and whether there is a difference between adults and children? Could it be possible explanation besides differences in anatomy for the unexpected uh, LTP-like effects for cathodal stimulation of one milliampere? Yeah, this is very, very good question. And then about this inhibitory, excitatory balance, GABA, and so this is change with age. But I think this is change with age and it's different adults and then uh, children. But in this age subject, which, are, which we have include, it already goes to, to, to adults because we have from 10, 11, 12, and then somehow it's already reached this, this level of uh, neurotransmitter to adults. If you have this is uh, children with uh, only money after under five and so on, maybe could be explanation. But I think since our main, main age was 13, it's not not really could be explanation because they already reached this uh, adult state. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. Thank you. Next question from uh, Karti Kenyan. Uh, how to how to differentiate safety against tolerability in children beyond the questionnaires? What are the criteria? What, what uh, the criteria must be obtained to determine safety of the DCS in children? Yes, based on this questionnaire, I would suggest, and then we have just to have this uh, long after six months call and then ask again what happened. Of course, after six months, we will not ask call and ask if he's tingling. Hopefully not. But if it's a migraine headache, sleep the, uh, um, disorder, some problems and so on, based on this questionnaire, I think we can can get this data. For this reason, I'm telling that, uh, that we need so long lasting effects to check it. Of course, if you have this is uh, parallel imaging studies, EEG and so on, it's better. But in the questionnaire, we have to six months after simulation and one year, dependence on age groups could be helpful, yeah. Okay, next question from M. Uh, how, how long was the session where the seizure occurred? If you, if you do low dosage with short length of session, like five minutes, would that increase the safety of the safety? Uh, simulation was is about the, the 20 minutes for two milliamperes, but uh, I don't think so. This is if you have this is a short stimulation, it will be different. Actually, I cannot 
difficult to say. And if you, especially if you know that this our this case this is uh, not really related to stimulation and uh, hard to say, but with short stimulation, um, it could be just as a uh, provocator, this is epileptic seizure, but uh, I cannot say exactly what is this minimum duration of stimulation to avoid this epilepsy. Again, if we know this is uh, no causal link between the stimulation and uh, epilepsy. Important yeah, is have... just to be sure that uh, from this screening was threatening no epilepsy here. Yeah, so, so yeah, we have to mention here that the, the seizure was not related yeah. to stimulation. Exactly. No, it was related no. to the press screening. Uh, exactly. Uh, the, the giving negative uh, yeah. for epilepsy. Child already it was, has uh, epilepsy. Positive. Yeah. yeah, this child already has epilepsy. Problem was she did not know, the parents did not know about it. It was just accident that happens during the study. Yeah. So the, the suggestion actually from, from Vera was to not only ask uh, if there is a history in a, in, a, in a medical records regarding epilepsy, but ask some deeper question regarding the seizures, regarding the, uh, some, some unspecific movement related to epilepsy that the, the non-professional can explain. Yeah. And you as a professional actually could yeah. somehow uh, detect if this can be related to epilepsy or yeah. not. And obviously, um, uh, family history if, if yeah. related to epilepsy. Muscle jerks, because they not realize it could be something to do this one. We ask this one, but you know, just the more more uh, again and again that what could be happening. Yeah. And obviously differentiating if something is yeah, epileptic absolutely. or non-epileptic, obviously yeah, it could not roll out a, a patient that could be treated. Uh, next question uh, related to, to autism. What are some quantifiable, sensitive and specific outcome measures for, for autism other than reaction time? Do you have any recommendations? And I, I guess this is related to the, to the effect of stimulation in, in autism. Um, uh, sensitive and sensitive. Oh, which outcome, how can we measure? Yeah. Uh, do you mean there are the different studies? Yeah, there are some studies for this autism, some some sort of social uh, tasks, for them that um, some different spe specific tasks for the empathy and so on. They are measure uh, like this. Maybe there are also studies using using some cortical excitability parameters and so on. But depends on the where we stimulate and then what we are looking for. I mean, depends on the task. It could be the theory of mind network, what is very special for this autism, and then corresponding this task can be used to, to find out these outcomes of this um, stimulation, and then to see effects there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so actually, actually, this is, uh, if, if you were talking about uh, neuroimaging and neurophysiological yeah. measures, you could, uh, you could always use uh, EG, for example, or, or fMRI or other neuroimaging techniques and do this pre and, uh, and post and somehow uh, show the difference uh, before and after the stimulation. But you need the, the baseline always for exactly. the specific yeah. subject, yeah. especially in yeah. autism. Yeah. Um, next question from Mukarti Kayan. Uh, does applying sham stimulation, one milliampers with playing cognitive brain games simultaneously uh, would be safe for three year old toddlers? Three years, okay. Three years. I, I don't know, it's just as if there's any studies they are using, so this is... Does the function of the cognitive brain be safe? Actually, yeah, so, so first would be if uh, yeah. uh, applying uh, simultaneously task will yeah. improve the stimulation. So this was this your your comments regarding yeah. online and offline stimulation. Exactly. The yeah. second, obviously, is what we are commented already regarding yeah. the, the stimulation in in uh, very yeah. very very young uh, kids. Uh, so the, the, this this we commented already, and we have to be careful because yeah. there yeah. is the where neuroplasticity occurs. But Absolutely. regarding the online yeah. and offline stimulation, yeah. do you mean which is better, online yes. offline yes. stimulation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In our case, it was, for example, at the behavioral level, we did not found uh, any differences between online and offline effects. What was interesting, we found that for EEG parameters, online stimulation was more effective. And again, depends on the task also, because if you deal with stimulation and in the task, same time that you reach high level, maybe you cannot see any effect, but then you need additional tasks to find the cell sensitivity. I mean, uh, parameters to say this is a better. But if, uh, studies, for example, for, for um, uh, they're using this training with stimulation and task same time for patient groups. And then 
every day it could be looks like better but again we are here talking about healthy children and we always have to say we have all the problem is selling effect what we are looking for and if somebody from beginning is good you know just this combination is always difficult but for many studies showing this online stimulation should be better but depends in uh, yeah okay thank you very much uh, um question from randy is there any studies with uh, uh, your education, uh, for example, repetitive math training using TDCS stimulation. So I think this is the general question regarding. Yeah, this is a, there are studies for training and TDCS. Is yeah, this group from uh, Cohen Kadosh, they are doing this is yeah, training and stimulation, but they are doing more as I know more uh, random noise stimulation than TDCS. But they are combined this is yeah, everyday training and then stimulation also. There is also with TDCS, but almost they are going now. In uh, direction. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, actually, the uh, yeah. with mm, we can we can we can use a reference from uh, Emiliano Santarnecki, for example, yeah. uh, publications or Kadosh uh, publications. Yeah. With, Kadosh, with yes, this, because uh, there is this much in numerical cognition, and then they are always actually I have to say uh, combined with the same task with the training, not only stimulation, but just to to uh, combination. Yeah. Okay, next question from Radoslav. Is physician supervised TDCS gaining popularity among parents and medical community? Uh, you mean getting popularity? Uh, physician, uh, we have, for example, I, had, I don't know if I really correctly understood, but we have here uh, neuropediatrician. I mean, this is just, 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 to, just to check and then screening and so on. And then these cases, it was. Do you mean this one, or I, I understood not correctly? Yeah, even the one is from, from related to physician supervised TDCS. Uh, I've, I, I guess it's uh, it's uh, popularity of not uh, in the lab uh, uh, yeah. stimulation, but also home stimulation that is somewhat supervised. Yeah. yeah. In our case, again, and just so of course for this uh, we have this is uh, physician, but generally if you're the patient groups, yes, yeah. But in this case, we can we can say that actually, and and with uh, with um, with the COVID situation, yeah. the at home stimulation will be much more popular and will be gaining pop, uh, sure, popularity yeah. and the effectivity yeah. uh, with with the remote uh, with the yeah. remote uh, application. And this we can call physician supervised stimulation, yeah. where you don't have to um, go to the to the clinic every day, and you are getting the stimulation. Uh, uh, based on the remote stimulation. Um, okay, we're going to the end. Next question from Vitold. In studies on dorsolateral prefrontal cortex stimulation in children, do you use IQ test? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Or other psychological neurophysiological yeah. physio test uh, um, with low IQ? Yes, we are using an NHS for us is a screening, right? Just we have to say cut. I mean, uh, of course, this we have this minimum 85, but for the screening, yes. Yeah, and some, some children we had to exclude because it is not, uh, but not enough equal. Yes, but it's for ours, it's a quiz, it's a screening and then to exclusion, uh, uh, inclusion for criteria for this, yeah. Okay, and last question from Helena. Congratulations for the great talk. Were the children able to detect sham and verum stimulation? No. I mean, uh, just to import the side effects, once it's part of multi-channel stimulation, they detect but uh, for, for one spot, but actually we are able to blind. And in this study, we are uh, uh, double blind also. We are also blinded, but it was not uh, not really, no. And then based on the side effects, you can see also this is a ching and then uh, this is uh, not no different. Even for shame stimulation, somebody's there more, and then it's possible to blind. Okay, sorry, yeah, I, I, I can see now that there are some questions in the chat, not in the QEA. Sure. Uh, from Lillian, uh, the last question. Uh, what is your preliminary impression based on your latest study regarding the comparison between individualized, uh, individualized optimized stimulation versus non-individualized -individual, multi-electrode non-touch? Say again, sorry? Uh, differences is, between individualized and not individualized? Yes, with the preliminary impression because we don't have uh, the, the, the final results yet. <laughs> we hope that it will be better, but same times, you know, we are working. This is yeah, as a multi-channel stimulation. We have to be very precise and then very carefully, 
because if you are just a small change in the brain and it puts these electrodes in the correct place should be and uh, we hope it will be different for this reason we are doing this one and i hope next year i will, can tell you more about it it was our motivation to do the individualization yeah. okay and a uh, question from floriana there are many differences in terms of excitability and plasticity between typical and atypical brain yeah. uh, uh, developing children and also differences between various developmental disorders. How do you think that healthy brain child, child models can help in understanding atypical responses? Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. And then what I know, this is, uh, um, of course, in this patients, we have different, uh, different uh, brain activity. And of course, we cannot say this is this one. But as I, as I mentioned before, if you are talking about this is a transfer parameters, at least we have to transfer the stimulation parameters from the same age group. How do we know? Because so far we are using parameters based on these adult studies. And then we are now this optimization with healthy children, this is modeling and so on, help us to find out a way how to optimize the stimulation in a, a pediatric brain and a pediatric patient also. And then again, what we are talking about, just one component that is this uh, anatomy, but Rafael, as you mentioned before, we have to take account also neurophysiological. Yes, of course, this is limitation, but again, at least we have same age group. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, question from Ecuador. We have project about the consequences of inflammation by COVID in children. Have you any study about the effects on brain inflammation uh, related to brain stimulation? So this is the directly request for collaboration from Ecuador. And related okay, to, to the very we cannot, hot topic we can talk separately. It sounds great. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So please contact Sorry. Bella if you want <laughs> maybe to. Maybe, yeah. If you want to have a collaboration with uh, with Ecuador yes. directly. Why and, not? Yes. Uh, Where I will be open open to to any any Thank request. You. Uh, you have uh, a lot a lot of greetings and uh, and thanks in, in in the chat. Thank so you, thank people. you very much. Thank you very much for. Uh, joining us today. Um, I hope uh, that you enjoyed the, the presentation and everyone enjoyed the, the, um, the webinar and, uh, and you will join us again for the, for the next webinar. You can, uh, you can visit our webpage at neurolexic.com uh, for more information and for the upcoming webinars. Uh, so once again, thank you very much. Uh, have a great day uh, and see you next time. Thank you, Vera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you. Bye-bye.